thanks, you, thanks to the Academy for inviting me a, sh a second time in a short period of time to, to the Basque Country. It's always a, a pleasure to be here. Uh, Mikael said that you are able to learn from me, but I can tell you that I have learned a lot of things from uh, reading stuff on the Basque Autonomous Community and continue to do so. So, as Mikael said, there is this close interaction, in fact, in reversing language shift literature between uh, practice and theory. Now, when talking about uh, language shift and language uh, shift reversal, you can do a number of things, of course. You can approach the phenomenon from different types of angles. You can focus on academia, you can focus on policy or policy making, and you can also focus on real life. What I would like to do in the next, let's say, 35 to 40 minutes is to focus a bit on all of that and to show you that a lot of interaction exists between academia, real life and policy. So I will start by focusing a bit on academia, we'll then move to policy, to the link between policy and academia, and in a final step I will combine policy, academia and real life. Now, we've heard it already this morning in the first talk, the talk given by Mikel, that language shift, is co of course, as a phenomenon, and also reversing language shift, is nothing new. It has been there, at least, uh, I would say, since the 18th, 19th century. So, also, uh, scholars working uh, on languages have been focusing on language shift and language uh, shift reversal, at least since the 1920s. Mikael mentioned uh, the, the Basque Language Academy, but you can also find instances of this in uh, German literature, French literature, etc., etc. Of course, in the 1950s, uh, let's say, the number of scholars who started to focus on language shift and language uh, shift reversal increased because of the simple reason that, of course, we saw the emergence of applied linguistics and sociolinguistics in the late 1950s which had a number of consequences, because when a number of people start to dedicate their research to a certain topic, what you see is an increase uh, in, uh, let's say, in terminology, in terminology that competes, in a sense, and that partly overlaps. So what you see in terms of language shift is that you find other terms or concepts in literature, language drift, language uh, replacement, language endangerment, loss, death, obsolescence, and on the other side, maintenance, regenesis, revival, revitalization. And of course, scholars then start to discuss what does this really mean and what is the difference between loss and death. And then you get theoretical discussions that do not necessarily have anything to do with real life. And you can also apply different perspectives. You can focus on the language itself, you can focus on the speakers, you can focus on the groups. You can focus on language documentation, so document what is there, but also on policy, planning, etc., etc. So those different uh, types of focus exist, and when the number of literature increases, you also uh, notice that people start to focus on many different situations in many different corners of the world. So, uh, today, when you look at, let's say, the international literature on language documentation and revival, uh, you can see that uh, there is a certain tendency to apply a global perspective. That's also something we heard in Jon Sarasua's talk uh, this morning. So, people like Michael Krauss, uh, people like uh, those working in the ad hoc group of the UNESCO that focuses on endangered languages, people from the ethnologue, they try to compare situations all over the world. I don't know if you know it, but 2019 is also the International Year of Indigenous Languages that will be inaugurated in Paris later this month. Uh, so there is this tendency to focus on, let's say, global, the global perspective of language endangerment and language revitalization, which is, of course, a justified focus because it allows us, let's say, to uh, reflect on global diversity, the spread of languages, the degrees of vulnerability that we are confronted with when we start to compare different situation, uh, situations. The downside, of course, of uh, applying a global perspective is that it becomes, let's say, quite difficult to start comparing situations because you're confronted with so many different ecologies of language that you're, in fact, you know, talking about different things while applying the same topic to those things, which, of course, uh, does not facilitate the comparison. Another thing that you see when looking at uh, international literature on language revitalization, documentation and the like, is that Europe plays quite a marginal role 
in the international literature. Which is, of course, quite logical if you know that Europe indeed only represents 2 to 4% of the world's languages. That is one possible reason. Another reason is that when you look at language minority communities in Europe, that you are mostly confronted with communities that either are, are considered to be, or, or are on their way of becoming established minorities, meaning that they are minorities that are sort of backed up by political and uh, political structures, organizations, institutions, something that you do not necessarily find, let's say, in Africa or in other parts of the world. And a third reason that I can think of, but I have to admit these are educated guesses, uh, so a third reason could be that the, the approach to language shift reversal in Europe, as you can find, and most certainly in Western Europe, is quite a technical approach. If you would like to use a negative word, you could even say it's a technocratic uh, approach, uh, meaning that you get lots of interaction between different, let's say, policy makers at different levels, the regional, the local, the national, the supranational level, and also quite some interaction between let's say, language policy officers, academia and uh, cultural associations. Now, these interactions have long existed. If you have a look at the literature on the social history of minority languages in Europe, uh, such as the book published by Kremnitz in uh, 2013 on the social history of the languages of France, or an, a very interesting article I read in, in a book published on the uh, sociolinguistic situation in the Basque Autonomous Community, written by somebody who has to be here, I think, Pachi Juaristi, who, who wrote a, uh, uh, an overview of the, the history of the language reversal movements in the Basque country. So you notice that there is, uh, let's say, there, there have been attempts at the beginning of the, well, at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, where you have a first period of ethnic revival, where you see lots of interaction between academia and also policy makers and cultural associations. A second sort of, let's say, phase around the 1960s, 70s. Then you entered into a more technical phase, I could call it, of language uh, reversal in the 1980s that partly coincided with initiatives that were taken at the supranational level in Europe. Supranational here meaning the level of the Council of Europe and the European Parliament. Because in 79, as you might recall, those of you who were already born, I was already born in 1979, uh, the European Parliament was uh, elected for the first time in a direct way, which means that you had representatives from the regions who entered the European stage and who also put, let's say, the, the topic of minority languages on the political agenda of the European Parliament and also of the General Assembly of the Council of Europe. So what you see at the beginning of the 1980s is that lots of discussions are going on on what to do with these minority languages, how to, let's say, maintain linguistic diversity. Lots of recommendations are put on the agenda, lots of um, resolutions. There is even a public hearing that is organized in Strasbourg in 1984. And what is very interesting for you, of course, but you already know that, is that uh, the, the Basque country and also the Basque autonomous community, Catalonia, Wales and Ireland, were taken as examples on what to do at the more, let's say, European level for minority language communities. And one of the documents that was prepared at the time is the European Charter, Charter on Regional or Minority Languages. that was published in 1992 and uh, entered into force in uh, 1998. Now, it hasn't been mentioned before today, but this charter is, I think, a, a well-known frame of reference in European discussions on the preservation of uh, linguistic diversity. And this uh, charter is even more a frame of res reference than other, let's say, international documents that exist on the topic. It's a frame of reference in the development of regional national policies on minority language. It, it's a document that has a highly symbolic value, but it's also a language planning instrument. Why? Well, because some, let's say, language planning scholars, language policy scholars, were involved in the development of uh, the document. Now, I will not bother you with details, but just very briefly, what is this charter about? How, what does it look like? Well, it has five parts, of which the third part is the most in interesting part, let's say, from the point of view of language uh, re shift reversal, because it contains a number of measures that could help minority language communities to promote 
the use of the regional or the minority language. Some hundred measures in total that cover, let's say, different thematic areas such as education, uh, the legal services, administration, media, culture, economy and social life and transfrontier exchanges. Now, the member states of the Council of Europe are not, let's say, obliged to sign or ratify the Charter. I come from a country, Belgium, that, that is known for notoriously, let's say, uh, um, refusing to sign the Charter because, because it would interfere too much with the national legislation on languages. So that is the, the reason why Belgium will, I think, never sign uh, the Charter because it would have to change its constitution if it would uh, sign the Charter. Now, those who sign and ratify the Charter, they are in fact, let's say, obliged or supposed to uh, implement uh, a minimum of 35 measures uh, from Part 3 of the Charters. Those are three measures, let's say, from the domain of education and culture, and one measure having to do with uh, legal things, administration, the media, and transfrontier exchanges. Um, this part three does not necessarily apply, as you might know, to all minority languages on a state's territory. So you can ignore part of, of, let's say, the minorities that exist. That is what Hungary did with the very small minorities. And uh, what you also should know is that part three of this charter that deals with the measures is, uh, let's say, subject to a monitoring process. So there is a committee of experts at the level of the Council of Europe that regularly visits regions all over Europe to see if the governments, the local governments, the national governments, the regional governments actually do what they promised. And then they write a report and give some recommendations. But of course, since the uh, uh, charter is part of the so-called soft law, uh, what you often see is that those recommendations do not really have, let's say, consequences in real life. Now, why do I mention the Charter? Well, because the Charter is a perfect example of the interaction between policy and academia. Because if you look at the structure of the, the Charter, which was published in 1992 and based, of course, on the literature available before 1992, what you see is that the three main dimensions or uh, language policy and planning activities that Mikel also mentioned in his talk are covered by the Charter. There is a little part that, has, that deals with the corpus. That's under, let's say, the, the disguise of translating terminology. There is a bigger part that uh, covers uh, the status of the languages. Yagon, if I uh, correctly understood uh, this morning, it is in, in Basque, right? Or something like that. So those are articles 9 to 13. And then there is a substantial part of the charter that focuses on acquisition. So that is everything that has to do with education. Uh, it also corresponds, the charter, to the literature that was available on, uh, at the time because it reflects a belief that has long been part of language policy and planning literature that successful language maintenance or shift reversal depends on so-called mutually reinforcing tailor-made measures. So when you uh, develop measures, they should be tailor-made. So that means they should be in line with the specific ecology of language that you are confronted with and they should be mutually reinforcing. That means that when you develop one measure, or let's say when you develop five measures, what you should try to do, at least from a theoretical point of view, is to try and develop measures that are in one way or another connected and reinforce one another. A third point here that is also important is that the Charter, at least in theory, acknowledges the need for evaluation as a very decisive step in language maintenance and language shift reversal. It is, in fact, it is meant to be a, a Charter that allows a community develop, to develop a dynamic language policy that changes over time. So you, you should, in fact, after five years, be inclined to apply new measures and not stick to the measures that you picked out when you ratified the Charter. But the thing is, of course, or one of the problems is that uh, this dynamic part of the, of the policy is not always, always or perhaps even never uh, applied. So when you look at the Charter and you try to evaluate it from a more current theoretical uh, point of view, taking current theories on language policy and planning into account, you see that there is in the Charter a very strong focus, it's an understandable focus of course, on education and culture, 
You also see, as I said, that it's quite a static document that not really, it is meant to be, but in reality it does not really invite the ratifying parties to, de to, de to develop uh, dynamic policies. Also, and this is I think quite a weak point of the Charter because it's not accompanied by a toolkit that could be of help in, let's say, selecting measures uh, on the basis of what Fishman called ideological clarification. So before you select measures, you should know what you want. That's what it basically come down, comes down to. So you should define a number of goals and say, okay, this is where we want to go to in the next five, ten years with our language community, and this is what we need, and this is what we will put in place. So that is not something that is uh, available, let's say, on the website of the Charter. It is not accompanied by a toolkit that allows you to elaborate tailor-made measures, that allows you, let's say, to, to, or that shows you how you could implement the measures and the kind of resources, human resources, financial resources, institutional resources that you need. And it does also not really pay attention, let's say, to what the evaluation should be and how the evaluation should be linked, let's say, to uh, a renewed implementation or a better implementation of the original measures that were selected. Now, you could say, of course, when, when looking back, because when, well, that was, that's more than 30 years ago since, since it was uh, published. So, uh, when you look back at, at the literature that, that has been published since the 1990s, you could in fact say, and Mikhail already mentioned it in a sense, that the, the charter was published a bit too early. Why? Because at the beginning of the 1990s, uh, you saw uh, a very strong pragmatic turn in language policy and planning literature. It's not a coincidence that uh, Fishman came to visit uh, the Basque country in the 1980s, uh, at the late 1980s, beginning of the 1990s, because that is in fact indeed where, where he got his inspiration for his theory on reversing language shift. Of course, the book was only published in 1991, and it's only when something gets published, of course, that it starts to influence the developments of language policy and planning measures uh, in uh, different kinds of uh, settings. Um, so what is this pragmatic turn about in language policy and planning theory? Well, it's uh, about a focus on the do's and don'ts of language planning. So it's, it, it shows you a bit, well, these are possible scenarios, this is how policy works, this is how planning works, these are the different steps in uh, the, the language policy and planning processes. It's a focus on the what, right? On what you should do, perhaps more than, how, more than uh, why you should do it, right? And also the how you should do it plays a very important role here. And what you see is when you look at uh, the books mentioned here on, on the slide, like Fishman's Reversing Language Shift, language planning from uh, practice to theory, from Kaplan and Baldauf, even the Euromosaic report, uh, the, the first one, there you get a focus on frameworks, on scales, on costs and benefits that play a role in language maintenance and language shift reversal. Now, we could use the next, let's say, 20 minutes to start discussing uh, Fishman's uh, graded intergenerational disruptancy scale. Uh, would be a very interesting discussion, but I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to focus on a more simplified version of the GITS, you could say, which is a, a model that is mentioned in the, it's a very nice title, in the SMILE report, written by François Grain and Tom Mooring. SMILE, in this case, means uh, support for minority languages in Europe, um, which is an interesting document because it contains a so-called policy to outcome path uh, that highlights, in fact, three conditions for language shift reversal that can be summarized as follows. One is capacity, the second one is opportunity, and the third one is desire. So capacity, opportunity, and desire are said to be three conditions for language shift reversal. I will, in a moment, I will explain uh, what, what is meant by that. But I would like to stress also that uh, this is nothing new at all. When, when you look at capacity, opportunity, desire, and you read books, books from the 1960s or from the 1970s, such as the, 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 the works, uh, and Miguel already mentioned it, works uh, published by Bill Mackey from Laval in Quebec. Well, what you find in his work, you find translated, in fact, in the SMILE report in a modern way. Right? So it's not that they invented something new, but what is interesting about the SMILE report is that uh, they relate the, the three conditions mentioned there, 
to policy diagnosis and analysis, to policy development and evaluation. And you could say, you could say exactly the same about Fishman's scale, because it also strongly influenced uh, what is uh, written in the SMILE report. Now, capacity, opportunity and desire in more detail. What is meant by that? So, capacity. Well, it's about capacity building. What, what is the biggest problem for language minority communities in Europe? and also in other parts of the world, that is that you are confronted with a decline in intergenerational language transmission. So what is going down is in fact people or the number of people who have the capacity to use the minority languages in many situations. So the question is how do you stop that or how do you reverse that? Two possibilities. You either focus on the reproduction of the minority language, which means the transmission of the language in the home, family, neighborhood, community. That's the natural transmission of the language. Second possibility, you focus on the production of the minority language, which means, of course, that you try to use all possible levels of education to bring young people to learn the language and to use it. Of course, the best thing is to combine both reproduction and production, as you also do in the Basque Autonomous Community, of course. Opportunity means that you have to try and create an environment in which the language is also actually used. Those are, well, part of that are the breathing spaces that Mikael uh, mentioned in his talk. But it's also about rights and resources, right? Because uh, people need the right to use their language, for, for example, at the level of administration. And you also have to make sure that there are enough resources that make it possible to use the language in different domains of society. Opportunity to use minority languages, uh, the language also forces you to think about the weight of different varieties of the minority language, but varieties of language in more general in society and in different domains of society, private, semi-public, public domains of language use. It also has to do with the passive use of the language and the active use of the language has to do with written uh, use of the language, oral use of the language, and those are things that all enter, in fact, into what I called ideological clarification before, because when you reflect on the use and you say, well, people have to start using the language, yes, but what do you mean with that? Have they have, do they have to start speaking the language, or is it enough when they can read the language? Right? And if they use it, how should they use it? In which domains do you want people to start using the language, etc., etc.? And the third part here, well, no, before I go to the third part, one important thing here is, of course, and that's not mentioned in the COD model in the SMILE report, is the language corpus, so the language itself. Because as it, as it has been mentioned before uh, here today, uh, when you want people to start using a language, let's say, at the level of higher education at a university, in, let's say, a mathematics course or chemistry, well, you need the terminology, right? So if you don't have the terminology, it's pretty useless to say now we're going to start using Breton uh, at university. If you don't have the terminology, it's not possible. So you cannot neglect the corpus either. And that's also uh, part of a famous book written by Fishman, Do Not Leave Your Language Alone, in which he stresses that it's also important to work on the language itself. Now, the third part here, the third um, uh, element in the COD model is the D, uh, desire. It means you could also say it's about the willingness to use the language. So when you want people to start using a language, well, they should feel the desire to use the language or they should be willing to start using it. So here it's about attitudes towards languages. It's about trying to convince uh, people uh, to, to use a language that if you want them to use it, of course, needs a certain status, needs a certain prestige that is attached to it. But because if that is lacking, of course, it will be a lot harder to convince people to start using that language. Now, so capacity, opportunity, desire, you can link those three concepts, of course, to the development of measures that you need to reverse language shift at a societal level. Of course, as it is mentioned, on the, on the bottom uh, side of the slide, those measures need to be context dependent. You cannot simply copy paste measures from one situation to another. That is uh, not a very good idea. As I already mentioned, it, they should be based on prior ideological clarification. 
also based on a good analysis and on an estimation of resources that you need, financial resources, human resources, institutional resources, etc., etc. And you should not forget when planning measures that language shift reversal is a dynamic process. You cannot say at point A, this is our strategy to reverse language shift, and now we don't have to care about it for the next 20 years. It, it, is, it is a process that, that changes, of course. For example, we see that in these days, when lots of immigrants come to a certain region in Europe, where a language mi minority language is spoken, then it is, of course, necessary for the language minority community to think about a strategy on how to include these people in, in, in let's say, uh, the language maintenance uh, strategies and the language revitalization strategies. Otherwise, you end up with a problem. So now I come to the last part of my presentation, which, in which I try to link policy, academia, and real life. Um, so as I said before, there, there are, you could say, at least from my point of view, two major, uh, let's say, challenges for many uh, language minority communities. First of all, convince people to, well, or, or make sure that there are enough people who are able to use the language, so that's the capacity building, and then bring the people to use uh, the language. Now, what you see in many European minority language communities is a tendency, I think, to emphasize or even to overemphasize two things. One thing is uh, the, the, the topic of rights and policies. So people think what we, what we need is language rights, right? We, we, we should make sure that people have the right to use their language and then they start assembling uh, documents with all kinds of in, international, uh, let's say, uh, recommendations and, and policies, etc. and say, look here, the United Nations says this, the European Parliament says that. It's of course very important also to secure the rights at the level of the, of the, the region and the local communities, but that's not enough, of course. Uh, it's, it's a fundamental basis, uh, it, it can help you to set the scene, but if you limit, let's say, uh, the actions to, let's say, establishing rights and policy documents, then uh, you do not, let's say, pass the stage of paying lip service uh, to the minority language. So what you should do is to accompany it by implementing very concrete measures. Another thing that is overemphasized, I think, quite often, is the role of education in reversing language shift. So, as I already mentioned, the, the reproduction at home is a very important thing for a minority language. What you now see is that there sometimes, I'm not saying in all cases, but sometimes there is a tendency to, to outsource the reproduction to schools. That, of course, play a role in the production of uh, the minority language, also, let's say, in the sense of... Uh, educating new speakers of, of the minority language. But uh, schools alone, of course, as Fishman stressed it many, many times, the school alone cannot do it. Uh, the, school has, the, the language offer at school has to be accompanied by uh, many other measures. Because when you look at language in education policy as part of a more general policy, what you see is that language in education policy consists of a number of sub-policies that you have to take into consideration if you want education to play a decisive role in capacity building and in the use of the language at societal level. Uh, just very briefly, what is language, education, uh, in language in education policy about? It's about the curriculum. It's about the staff that you need, it's about the materials that you need, it's about the kind of classrooms that you envisage, it's about the link between uh, classrooms and the community. We could go into detail here, I will not do that, but one of the most important things about education is that you have made to make sure that there is a continuum of education. You can't, it's not, it does not suffice to offer, uh, let's say, minority language at the level of kindergarten. The most important thing for a language community is that you start at kindergarten and end at university, right? Because otherwise there is a gap between... Can, you cannot expect that a child, a four-year-old child, who learns the minority language for 50 minutes at kindergarten, starts using it as an adoles, uh, adolescent or a 20-year-old student later in life. That is, I mean, uh, if you would apply the charter, that would be a, a possibility. But the question is, of course, is this useful or is it not? Now, should be, I won't be 
or I, I don't want to be too negative uh, about, uh, let's say, the, the, the role of school and societies. And to show that, I, I want to use a quote from Michael, who is sitting next to me here, uh, uh, who once wrote that, well, you wrote it on the situation of Basque, but you can apply it to other situations as well. For a long time, the school was the place where what was learned at home was lost. At the present time, it fulfills a quite different function. The school is currently a space where it is possible to confirm the competence level in your case, in Basque, brought from home, or even a place to learn what they haven't been able to learn at home and use it to a certain extent. So it helps pupils who speak Basque at home to improve their competence level. It helps uh, pupils who do not speak Basque at home to acquire the language. And it also helps them to use it, to, but to a certain extent. Now, this to a certain extent is important because it's a conclusion uh, that uh, uh, from, from the Arue, uh, report is, was, was a big study in uh, primary, secondary school, excuse me, secondary schools in the Basque country, meant to have a look. And Iñaki is here, uh, Iñaki Martinez de Luna, who, who was, was involved in, with the Sociolinguistica Clustera in, in this project. He can tell you a lot more about it than I can. But uh, we had, the, the project had a look at language use in the classroom and outside of the classroom at school. Right, just to monitor also the language uh, used in, in school settings. And uh, well, what, 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 what uh, could be noticed is that the language is used, let's say, at school to a certain extent. Right? And this to a certain extent means that the use depends on the age groups. There was the difference between primary and secondary school. It depends on the sort of space that the language is used in at school, the activity type. It depends on the role models that the pupils are confronted with. And, um, also an important conclusion, but that conclusion was not new at all, is of course that it's not because the language that is used at school that it will be used outside of the school. So one of the biggest challenges of uh, language minority communities is to convince pupils to, do, to not stop using the language when classes are over, but to continue using the language in uh, societal uh, spaces as it was mentioned before. So. And this is my last uh, slide, Mikael. I'm nearly finished. Yes, thank you. Um, so one of the biggest uh, challenges in language shift reversal is, in fact, uh, and I don't have an answer, so I, I, I will, will, uh, would like to, to add that immediately, is to create a link between capacity building and language use. And I added uh, creating an invisible link. I will uh, uh, explain what I mean by that in a second. But if you want to create a link between capacity building, so let's say educating people in a language and convincing them to use the language in uh, later st stages in life, you of course uh, need to monitor and invest in the kind of language competences and skills that you offer to the people. I know that, for example, in the Basque autonomous community, you need a certain level of Basque knowledge to be able to enter public service or, or to, let's say, to fulfill certain uh, duties uh, for society. The question then is, of course, because I heard a story yesterday that quite struck me uh, about a music teacher uh, who, uh, well, who teaches, I don't know what, what exactly, but who is active in, in an academy of music and uh, who needed a certificate for Basque to be able to teach in that academy, but who does not use Basque when speaking to the pupils. So the question then is, you need a certain level of competence, but is it monitored? To, is, it, is it possible, let's say, to actually make sure that the people who need that certificate also start using the language in that certain context? Without, of course, being a language police who says, well, you, do not, you, you naughty man or naughty woman, you do not use the language, you will be reprimanded, etc., etc. That might not be the best uh, strategy either. But it nevertheless uh, puts the question of uh, how to monitor these things on the map. And uh, creating a link between capacity building and use, of course, also implies the necessity to monitor or invest in what you could call an as normal as possible or as social as possible use of the language. I, what I mean by that is that, that it does not become artificial to use the language. That's also, I think, the idea be behind the whole concept of normalization in, in, in sociolinguistics, that you have the impression that what, what you are doing is normal. Right? Is, is not some kind of an exception, but that the, using the minority language is like using any other language, right? Like, like using the majority language is something very uh, natural uh, to do. And in order to create uh, such an atmosphere, of course, the, the, 
the, the, the, the social fabric of your society is very important. So if you have enough, let's say, organizations, uh, bottom-up uh, civil society platforms or whatever that back up the use of the language or that carry the language in society, that create almost in a natural, organic way, create the necessary uh, spaces to start using the language and to, to give the language this breathing space, that of course uh, facilitates, you could say, language maintenance and language reversal. The only question is, how, how, is, is it possible to plan that? Or, or in how far is it possible to plan that? Do people want that to be planned? Because you can also over plan things, right? Or give people the impression that you are interfering with their private life, <clears throat> which they don't want, of course. And then you have the opposite reaction. And people will start to distanciate themselves from, from the minority language. And that's why I stress the invisible link. So what do I mean with an invisible link? Well, I'm not so sure what I mean by that myself, but I, I will try to explain it. So I, I think what I mean is that you should try and uh, find some, some sneaky way to arrive at, at, at the point that you want to arrive without the people noticing that you are taking necessary measures to arrive at that very point. So it's, it's a kind of psychological terror, in, in a sense, uh, you could say. Um, but uh, what... It's, it's about creating desire and creating willis, willingness, in fact, but in a way that is not necessarily noticeable, right? Bringing people to do something because they want it, not because you want it, but because they want it. Now, the question is, of course, can you do that in, in a very short term? That is the question. Perhaps you can, perhaps you cannot, I don't know. But what Mikael uh, told today, of course, also struck me as very interesting. If you would look, compare the situation in the Basque country today with the situation, let's say, 30, 40 years ago, of course there have uh, been things that changed in a negative way. A negative way in the sense that there are less, perhaps less, mother tongue speakers of Basque. But if you would look at what you arrived or, or what you already achieved, in terms of other things, like, for example, the visibility of Basque in the linguistic landscape, uh, the fact that you can use it in administration if you want to, then there are lots of things that you have achieved, but that you perhaps do not notice any longer today, because they are there, right? So then that is kind of some kind of an invisible act as well, but in the long run. Right? And those are the long-term effects, in fact, of uh, language policy and planning that you also, also should aim at. And that is uh, what I remembered. I learned a bit of Basque today as well. Emeki, emeki, so slowly, slowly, right? Uh, you, you should not uh, try to do everything at once, but also try to plan things in the long term and, and try to develop a vision for the language that, let's say, surpasses, uh, let's say, the day-to-day the, the -day perception or, or the short-term visions that are sometimes characteristic for, uh, well, for some politicians, not for, for all of them. But I will stop here. Perhaps you can, we can talk about it a bit longer during the questions. This is the reference list, if you would be interested. Um, and thank you for listening. Eskeri Casco. And thanks also to the translators. I hope that I didn't talk too fast. <coughs> Uh, <coughs> thank you anyway. Thank you, Jeroen. Your presentation has been clarifying, as always. Now we have 15 minutes, only 15, for the participants' questions in order to precise some aspects of the RLS. So, please. Mikkel Morris is here. Um, I was going to do this in English in so English. we don't have to okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, deal with translations. Sorry. So, um, as you are a Fleming, you're from Flanders, uh, I think you could uh, give some insight into how Flemish actually uh, staved off, um, stopped the language shift that was going on, arguably, in Belgium itself. As you know, I'm telling you know, but other people might not. Mm -hmm. The Kingdom of Belgium only came into existence in 1830 after getting its independence from the Kingdom of the Netherlands. When it gained its independence, uh, Belgium was only French-speaking, officially. 
So what happened, what I understand, you can confirm this or not, that um, there was a period in, around the 1850s or 1860s in which people started getting worried about the condition of the Flemish language, and they didn't know which kind of Flemish to do, so they eventually decided on the Schaaf Nederlands, the civilized Dutch, as their, um, let's say, corpus. Mm -hmm. And what they did, among other things, is, um, well, they had problems. Uh, the Franz Guillon, the French-speaking uh, Belgians, some of whom also spoke uh, Flemish, they said, well, we shouldn't really worry about Flemish because it's a burtal, it's a uh, peasant language, farmer's language. And French is universal, whereas uh, Flemish is a ridiculous uh, local language. But uh, eventually, uh, what I understand is this was uh, overcome by the fact that Biskoff Nederlands, the standard Dutch, was used as a corpus, and essentially they stopped using French in so many spheres. And they turned to, of course, Dutch and also to English. This is one reason why perhaps the Flemish speak English quite well and the Wallon usually less well. There are really exceptions. Here in the Basque country, um, people always talking about, oh, speak more Basque, speak more Basque, but essentially to speak more Basque, this implies, entails that they have to speak, use, and read less uh, Spanish or French. It's a zero-sum game. Doesn't mean they have to abandon Spanish or French. I'm just saying they have to speak less of it. And so still uh, the Basques, at least in the southern part, always look to Spanish as the only model. It's getting, fortunately, the generations, younger generations are seeing that this is ridiculous. But still, the young Basque people, because I know them because I've been a teacher for decades here, they still have many problems. Uh, I mean, speaking Basque. And one of the big problems, I'm, I'm going to finish my question, is uh, now they're in, inundated, they're flooded with Spanish or French with subtitles Excuse in me. Spanish and the, and the Netflix and everything, and they don't even know how to say Excuse oats me. or anything. Excuse me, dear Michael, please. I know, I, I'm just, about, just about to finish. So my, finish, my, my question is, I was just about to do that, my question is, how would you comment on this from a Flemish point of view? Okay. Well, to, to try and build a link to what I explained before, so 1830 is indeed uh, the, the time when, when, when Belgium was, was uh, well, what, what was it, established? Um, they, we say after a revolution, but there was no revolution at all. Um, but uh, from the very beginning, so there is, uh, there is one thing that I, I would like to clarify. Belgium has th three languages, right? So you have Dutch, you have French, and you have German. In the Constitution, if I'm correct, uh, even in 1830, 1839, because there was a territori territorial modification of the country in 1839, where we lost a big part of the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg. Uh, so Dutch also had an official status in Belgium from the very beginning. But the thing is, of course, that in Belgium you were confronted with a so-called trans-ethnic uh, elite that, was, that, that ruled, let's say, the communities that was represented at the level of the parliament, etc. So what you had was, uh, and, and that links up to what I said about policy, so you, you have the constitution where they say, say three languages, right? But in reality, you are confronted with, let's say, a disequilibrium. You are, have a country that is ruled in French, and where you see that at the official level, at the uh, level of politics, at the level of the, uh, the laws, etc., that, that French plays a, v a much more important role in society than Flemish, which at that time, we have to say, was not standardized yet in Belgium. Right? So what they spoke were dialects, local dialects, and they had the impression, the peasants, that their language was, of, of course, a bit inferior to the big French language of the big French neighbor, because this language was also used by the bourgeoisie, by the people who were uh, in, in charge of the country, right? Who indeed also spoke the local Flemish dialects very often. And then uh, the, the, the climate, because that links up to the first period of ethnic revival that you also see in many language minority communities, the end of the 19th century, right? A period of a sort of romanticism where people start to get interested in their own languages, their own language varieties, and start, let's say, to strive for a, a language a status upgrade for their own language. 
That is also what you see in Flanders. You have a Flemish movement that comes into being in the second half of the 19th century and that man manages to, to put, let's say, the language question on the political agenda that manages to have some uh, laws, let's say, implemented and to secure, uh, let's say, the right to use Flemish in court. Uh, so that, that takes a couple of decades, uh, this process is interrupted by the First World War, but what you see after the First World War, so between 1918 and 1940, is that you have a new language law that comes into being and that is the predecessor of the principle of territoriality, which is so important for Belgium because that is the principle on which the, the, the country and the political division of the country is based. Because what, what is important if you want to understand the situation in Belgium, that is, of course, that you are in fact confronted with three more or less, I would say, monolingual territories or monolingual regions and one bilingual region, that is Brussels. So Flanders, you shouldn't think that all Belgians are multilingual or, or bilingual. In Flanders, people speak Dutch. They used to say Flemish, the younger generation now says Dutch because it's, it has a different connotation. In the Walloon part you have French, in the German-speaking community, 75,000 persons. You have a German and in the Brussels capital region, well, we don't know for sure, but uh, the majority, I would say that about 50% of the persons now speak French at home between 5 and 10 percent perhaps Dutch and all the rest, you know, there, there are very many bilingual families and also a lot of migrant communities that, that do not speak French or, or Dutch at home. So what, what you see in, in, in Flanders is of course that political processes have helped, uh, let's say, the situation of Dutch or if you would like to call it Flemish a lot. So it's, it's in fact this principle of territoriality that has contributed a lot to the stabilization, first of all, of the language situation in the whole country, because this is the principle that helped to politically neutralize language conflicts, because if you say, that is your language territory, that is yours, and that is yours, right? And shut up, I mean, you shouldn't start talking about using your language in the other part of the country at the communal level, because it, it doesn't work, the law does not, let's say, uh, allow it then you neutralize the conflict and you give, let's say, the different communities the floor to develop their own language and their own culture in their own way, right? The only problem, of course, that remains in, in such a situation is the following one, what to do with that part of the territory where more than one language has an official status, which is in, in the Belgian case, Brussels, or some of the communities that are located along the language border and where the legislator in the 1960s says, well, okay, for this minority that lives on the other side of the border, there are some language rights that can be granted if the community asks for it, or if the, the, those uh, uh, persons who speak, who do not speak the territorial language, but another language, ask for it. So that is what you see in the, some of the communities around Brussels, six communities that have language facilities, as we call them and where, let's say, uh, the, the, the French inhabitants who are supposed to use Dutch when, when they go to, let's say, the, the town hall, have the right to ask for documents in French because that is what the legislator uh, provided, right? Now, what we see now, of course, is that the situation, the demographic situ situation has changed a lot if you compare the 1960s to 2019. And that in some of those communities, of course, you are confronted with a majority of French-speaking citizens who live in a Flemish community. So from the point of view of law, that community belongs to the Flemish community. So Dutch is the official language. And you grant, in fact, language facilities to the majority of the population. And there you see that there is a different point of view in the balloon part of the country and in the Flemish part of the country. The Flemish part, they say, well, this is the law. What do you want to do about it, right? This is what we voted in the 1960s. And in, in other part of the countries, they, they focus more on, let's say, the, the situation today and the rights of individuals. But there you see, I think, and this, this can be applied to language minority settings as well, that uh, sometimes political decisions, if they are implemented, of course, can, of course, have a very, let's say, strong effect on, on the status of a language and the way in which you uh, start using the language in society. Of course, in the Belgian case, we are talking about six million uh, 
uh, Dutch speakers, five million uh, speakers of French, and uh, uh, an economic situation that has entirely shifted in, in, the, in the first, second half of the, of the 20th century and has, has turned Flanders into a knowledge economy and region that is, that is pretty well off, I would say. Right? So the economic status of, the, of the, the Flemish part of the country has also added to uh, an increase of the status of, 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 of Dutch, you could say. 